Uh, welcome everybody to today's Lunch and Learn. Uh, we have a very special guest today. Uh, Kitty Hurley is the Senior GIS Developer, uh, Senior GIS Developer and Team Lead at the State of Minnesota's Department of Natural Resources. And she is here today to talk to us about designing accessible maps for all. Uh, take it away, Kitty. Thanks, Al. And uh, thanks everybody for coming in today during lunch <laughs> to learn. So um, I, I'll give a quick introduction of who I am. Thanks for the warm introduction, Al, and um, kind of talk about why I think accessibility is really important. Um, I've, I've heard that there's a lot of interest in uh, Spark Geo and the work that you all, you all are doing. Um, so I want to learn more about that throughout this presentation as well. Um, I, I'm admittedly not super familiar with Google Meet, but um, I will try and follow along in the chat. And so throughout the presentation, feel free to interject if you have any questions or if I need to pause at any point to, to go through anything. I'm totally game for that. Make this an interactive session as well. So just for, for the, the future of this presentation. Um, so as Al mentioned, I'm a senior GIS developer and team lead at Minute um, Department of Natural Resources. And I have about 14 years of experience. I've gone from analysis and administration to now being in web development for the past decade or so. Um, I specialize in web accessibility, which is why I'm here today to talk to you. Um, I'm also really rehearsed in user interface, user experience, mobile first development, web frameworks, and front end web development. And I have a BA um, in geography and individual studies from Gustavus, which is in Minnesota and um, and also an MS, a Master of Science in GIS from St. Mary's also in Minnesota. And I always think it's important to talk about what you also like to do outside of work. So I like to visit state parks, play hockey, hike, paddleboard, and canoe. And here is me with my paddleboard this past fall. All right, so we're here to talk about accessibility. So what is accessibility? Um, Alan and Natalia mentioned that um, you guys have some experience with accessibility, but it's always important to kind of give that broad overview before we dive in. So accessibility is the practice of making content usable by as many people as possible. So we traditionally think of this about being somebody that has a disability, a known or it's, it's shown to be a disability. But accessibility can impact a wider audience. It can impact anybody that maybe doesn't even have a disability. It, it helps all people by giving this opportunity and, and putting it out there, making a better product or solution. So some examples are closed captioning on videos. I like to bring this up because my husband and I actually watch all of our movies, all of our TV with captions, and it's fabulous. There's a lot of things that you may not see, see physically without those captions. Um, also, uh, accessible ramps. That can be really useful if you have a potential, just a temporary injury um, at play. Uh, also, it can just be nice if you're really exhausted or tired. Maybe you didn't get enough sleep that night. Maybe you have a child, a young child with you. It can be a really useful solution for folks. Also curb cuts. This is huge. Um, it's really helpful for bikers and, um, and rollerbladers. I'm a rollerblader as well. So it, it can have multiple use cases, even though it was designed with accessibility in mind, there can be other kinds of things that can be helpful in providing those services. So I like to give this example. Um, this is at a local Target. This is right next to my house. I came over to um, to get some limes, or so I thought were limes. Now, for those of those of you that maybe don't have colorblind or that have colorblind deficiencies, this maybe looks like something to you. Um, and I don't want to like call anybody out, but um, it, does anyone feel free to? dismiss this. You don't have to raise your hand or put anything in the comments, but does anyone see a color associated with this that maybe is associated with limes to you? Oh, James, what do you see? You're muted. You're muted, James. On the, thank you. On the left side, it's green limes. Oh, you see green for the limes? Yep. See, this is interesting. Oh, so what? And then I didn't read it up there. It says orange. Uh, atop yeah. The orange. So, but does that? Does anyone else see a different color besides green? They look orange to me. Yeah, they look orange, and then the limes are on the left. The green limes are on the left. So this is where it gets interesting because when I came across this, I saw orange, 
but I did a double take. Is there something else going on here? Because maybe there was somebody who was stocking this product and maybe they saw something different, so, similar to what James saw. So actually when I did a color filter analysis after taking this picture, determined this is probably for those that maybe did see orange here, that there is a different color that's being depicted here. What does this look like to folks that saw orange in the previous photo? Look like big lines. It's a brighter shade of green compared to what's on the left. Exactly. So, so this this speaks to we have to so we have to think differently. We have to think outside the box. Not everybody can see things in the same respect, and so that goes into this color deficiency. So, James, I don't mean to call you out, but just saying that there are there are other ways to see these these depictions, and that's why it's very 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 important. Um, that it's, it's a perception that we have of color. And there's nothing wrong with having that deficiency. It is very common um, indeed. Um, it, it, there's at least two or three people that are in this call that have this deficiency. So it's a very, very common thing. So another, um, another type of deficiency is low vision. And this is another one that's very, very big on the web. And this is something, low vision is considered something that can't be corrected with glasses, contacts, or surgery. It isn't blindness as limited sight remains. And low vision can impact blind spots, poor night vision, and blurry sight. So we might be seeing more of this, especially with a pandemic, just because we're moving to everything virtual. And we're maybe seeing some of these things in like a, a more direct light. Um, and so this, this image kind of shows what that looks like. It can be really, it's really hard for me to discern. And I have supposedly 2020 um, vision, but it can be really, really hard the, the further down you go in the spectrum. So it's just something to keep in mind that a lot of these user types will do a, a zoom in on their browser or application, whatever that may be, map even um, in general. So to keep that in mind, that even if you think for you, if you have 2020 vision or somebody else near you wor that works with you has 2020 vision, that it may not appear that way to, to those users. So I just wanted to, this is a, a new um, table that I've put together in the last like couple months. And it's it talks about all the different kind of types of, of audiences that we're trying to hit. Um, the visual users, the auditory users, speech, cognitive, neurological, and physical. Um, there's a couple of different examples throughout, throughout all of these, but these were kind of like the top hit for best practice. So I'm, I'm, I'm running this past you all, and hopefully this makes sense. If it doesn't, let me know. I want to make sure I make corrections to this. But for visual um, disabilities, and I do see there's a comment here. Oh, OK, I missed that earlier. Sorry about that. Um, so for visual users, the best practice is including alternative text for images and sequential heading structure to facilitate screen readers. So that's your H1, H2, H3, et cetera, tags throughout, making sure that you don't skip over headers. That's a big one that a lot of folks forget about, especially with maps, when we have other company things with our, our, our map, to make sure that we're doing that order and we're not skipping over anything. Um, that's kind of the big one. For auditory, um, to provide closed captioning and include transcripts of audio and video content. Uh, for speech, to offer alternatives to speech input and provide means of other um, opportunities. So an example of that would be providing an email. For cognitive, so this could be, this can go all the way from like a, a short-term thing to a long-term scenario as well. Um, so it could be like a TBI, a traumatic brain injury that maybe has a, a short time frame, but also TBIs, the traumatic brain injuries can have a longer impact as well. So th this one is, there's a lot of new science and new information that's being held on this. But for cognitive users, just making the navigation, the page layouts easy to understand and use. And really, I, you, could, you could even say in some respects, if you don't get a good night of sleep or you had some, some other Thing like a dog barking near you or something to that impact that can potentially impact your cognitive ability. So it's a good rule of thumb to, to compare with what you consider quote unquote normal in your life and what could potentially be a prohibitor as well. So this could impact a, a wider array of, of folks. Um, neurological. Um, so this could be um, related to like seizures. It could be um, Related to anyone that um, this also could be a TBI, a traumatic brain injury as well. 
um, there's there's a lot of different pieces at play. It could be um, uh, I I won't get into the autistic spectrum as well, but I won't I won't get into too much of that today. But the the biggest takeaway for for that for best practices avoid blinking or flickering visuals. Um, just trying to ease people into a process rather than for something that's going to be really flashy, which is a big thing with maps. We do a lot of flashy things. Even a pop-up can be distracting potentially. So just trying to keep it so it's an ease into it. Um, and then the physical disability. So uh, for some of these folks, it could be like a mobility issue. Maybe they don't have um, arms available to them. So being able to provide options for those folks to be able to use speech for that or um, some, some other means. So in this example, um, it's talking about the keyboard input. Um, so for maybe folks that aren't able to leverage a mouse and be able to move around with the mouse, that's probably the physical one, um, the, the most recognized one in the community is um, keyboard navigation without a mouse. Any questions on any of those? And this is new, so I want to make sure that it's hitting some of some of those. This is very high level until we dive deep into stuff. Okay. So I'm going to dive into. There's two topics that I want to talk to 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 you all today about. One being map design, and then we'll get into interactive maps. And the reason I start with map design is because it just goes into if you make a very visually appealing map following a lot of best practice and standards, once you get to the web, you've done your due diligence and you've done a lot that you already need to do. So that's why we usually start with this topic to kind of get the conversation started and continue forth with, with what we're creating for a solution. So <laughs> this is one of my favorite maps, one of my colleagues, Amy, um, uses this one quite a bit, and it's awesome. It's a it's an old sea monster sitting near. Does anyone know where this is? Can you, can anyone guess where this might be? Just based on what we know historically, where sea monsters might be living in the world. Ireland somewhere. Scotland. Ooh. Yeah, I'd say like like North Sea. Mexico. Well, well, yeah, that's Mexico. Oh, cheers. Yeah, that makes sense. There's a there's a lot of good guesses. I didn't I was never thinking about the European area, but that makes sense as well because that is an area that could be considered dangerous, right? That's a sea monster. That's what we associate it with. This is um small hint in the bottom right. Oh, that's fair. <laughs> I guess I did give away, didn't I? Giving that source out. Um, but yeah, this is near like the Bermuda Triangle area. Um, this is what we at least when I was growing up, this is something we learned about Bermuda Triangle being a dangerous area. A lot of things went missing there. And so this on this map was depicted with a sea monster to to allow to to give out that information to sailors. This is a dangerous area. Be careful. And so that's what the depiction, the purpose of this map was. So it goes back to whatever map you provide, whatever map you're putting out there, it has to have a story and it has to be purposeful. And so these might be repetition for some of what you guys already do, what already provide as a service, but we have to consider a lot of things when we're making a map. And the first question is always, why do we need a map? Because sometimes do we actually need a map? Even though we are map people, this is what we do. Do we actually need this? And we always like to give out this example of Australia where they're sectioned off by territories. And then the population information is depicted in the legend. Now, does this make sense to be a map? Or do, can we rewrite it? Can we make it a table? Can we do it in a different way or provide it in a different means? And it goes back to what we were just talking about with the sea monster. What is the purpose of that map? Because if we want to tell a good story, we cannot get lost in the weeds. And what's even more important is we have to concentrate on the smallest amount of information possible to depict that in the map we're providing or the story we're trying to tell. So we try and say to aim for four elements within our map. And then getting back to that question of, do we actually need this to be in a map form? Could it be a table or graph instead? And maybe that makes more sense for what we're trying to put out there. So some other helpful tips is to check and make sure that we are using the appropriate scale and the page size for what we need to be depicted. 
And actually white space is okay. This is something we don't really think about too much, but having less visual clutter can make it much more understandable to our audience, especially for those cognitive um, folks. We wanna make sure that we're not providing too much information, that it's very clear, concise to the point. And then this is something that we do as a best practice just within my organization at the DNR is we always like to accompany the map with a legend. I know there's a lot of debate over, should we include a legend? Does that make sense? We always include it, as you can see with this example that is on, in the PowerPoint, that there's a lot of information going on here. We really cannot provide this map without a legend. It's absolutely necessary with, with all the information that we're depicting. Um, a scale bar for us, just because we have people going out in the field, they want to be able to check to see how far the distance of hiking trails that they're going on is very important. And then a compass and north arrow if, if appropriate. Um, unless the map is very basic, it's providing just very specific information, we recommend all of those elements to be within the map. So next, color as part of the map design process. Does anyone remember this big debate on the internet from like five years ago? Maybe it's more than five years ago. Yes. What, co <laughs> what color is this was, to you? Oh, it's no. just so badly white balanced you can't tell. Blue. <laughs> it's blue. <laughs> Any other colors? Blue and black. Yeah, I go with blue and black. Blue and black. Is that the only color that's seen? No, I, I, I think, saw you, James. I think white. White? I can go all the shading. That. Yeah. So there's a lot of colors that are seen here. This one was like hot. Everybody on all the social media platforms were debating over this one and people were adamant. This is what I see. And in fact, my, one of my great colleagues, again, Amy, her and I had a huge debate about this. We went out, we flew out to California and gave a presentation with this dress as a picture. And the two of us fought over this thing on the plane. Like I can't even make this up because I saw black and blue and she saw white and gold. And it's interesting, she actually went deeper into it and found out that there's some other considerations because she's a few years older than me, about five, 10 years older than I am. And so one of the things that she discovered is that age was a factor in what color you see as well, as is gender, that males and females had different perspectives on what this image showed. And then also a few people mentioned this as well, the assumption of the daylight of what is illuminated in the background it could kind of mess up the color, but it could even be our screens as well, because we're seeing this virtually in on our machines, whatever setup we have on our monitors. So again, it goes back to that perception of color. What are people actually seeing with that map? So best practices for designing maps with color in mind are to choose color based on information hierarchy. Base maps should be muted through transparency or the use of muted colors. And contrast is imperative when it comes to that. So for this example, we have this yellow line showing some information on our hunter walking trails. And there's a lot of contrast going on with our imagery that's in the background. Now it's not perfect, but it's a good example that there's a lot of contrast going on between our purpose that we're trying to show the hunter walking trails, but also providing some visual context to the land that's being shown underneath the trail. And then if possible, do not rely on color alone to communicate your information. So an, an example of this too, is this private land that's being depicted on, on this map as well. There's hashes throughout the private land and that's depicted here in the map. So not only do we have a line that's being shown um, on our map and highlighted. We also have areas that are highlighted, but they're also depicted with a crosshatch. So it can be really useful to provide not only the color context, but some other textual um, importance in the map as well. And then this is uh, one that Amy likes to point out as well is, is this map gonna be printed or is it only gonna be shown in the internet? Because those two differences can really change what information you're gonna provide with color. 
And so this is, um, these are all the color schemes that we've put together at the state of Minnesota. We have um, this available on our website. I can, um, I can post the link later on um, as well and provide these slides for folks. But we've put together um, all of these color palettes. It's in CMYK, RGB, and HEX. We recommend that each palette kind of stay within its own. So not to combine, for example, the jewel tone red with the brights red. Um, to not go go through the different um, options, but just to stay within each. And we've provided this not only um, in a PDF document, so you can run with it. We also provide it as Adobe um, download and um, within QGIS and ArcMap or um, ArcGIS Pro for downloads as well. So you can use it in additional products. These are vetted, um, good accessible color schemes to use in maps. Uh, so next is the map symbols and labeling. And so to, to get into the map symbols, it's, it's still key to go back to that map purpose. What is the map purpose? And that can really help dictate what those map symbols could potentially look like to you in your map. And it's really important to symbolize stuff that we know in the real world. And so some examples of that include maybe a tent for a campground to be depicted, a forest, could be a tree, airport being a plane, and then obviously the sea monster. You can't go away from the sea monster. It's always important uh, for, for danger. Um, but it's also very, very important. And I don't know if there's any symbol sets that, that you all have um, in, in your organization, but it's really important to have a standard set that you have internally. We have one at the DNR. Um, it's, they look similar to this campground one. We have a set of, I want to say, 500 plus different icons that we use. and that's what we leverage. And we continue to get feedback on it from a wide array of audience to improve on it in the future. Uh, label fonts. So I'm not going to go too much into depth with this one. Um, it's really just kind of keeping up with the map standards of the community. And that's kind of what we we recommend for folks. I guess the really big one with um, label fonts is the font size. And that goes back to audiences that have to maybe zoom in on a map, zoom in on an application. And so we recommend the minimum label size to be no less than six point, but the ideal size being eight to 10 around that, um, that area. Um, as far as like the typefaces itself, um, sans serif recommended mostly, but um, Times Ro New Roman is for, for water-based features. And then some other design considerations. Um, I think I have, I'm just gonna get these going here. So the low vision users to, to not use underlying text. So we really wanna reserve underlying text for any links that we see. Um, we don't want to overlap labels. And this is one of my favorites. Google Maps loves to do this. They have multiple labels that are all over the place. I remember one time I was up in the almost Canadian region um, of Minnesota, and there were labels upon labels upon labels in Google Maps. And I was like, I'm pretty sure I know where I am. Thank you, Google. Like, it's very clear to me that there are 10 labels of the same road that I am currently on and have been on for five hours. So I appreciate your, your persistence. Um, so it's just less information for your reader to figure out. Um, and then to not place labels at angles that are greater than, than 90 degrees when, when you can. And this is, this is one that um, we do have a, a, a little debate about in our, um, in our community of um, showing shadow text because it can be really useful in certain circumstances, but we just mean just be wary of the shadow text because it can get to be pretty frustrating for your user to be able to depict that information, especially if you have a lot of content. Um, and then these are some sparingly used items, um, halos similar to shadow text that can be good, but it can also, when overused, be difficult. Um, current text, also useful potentially, but it can be annoying to your user who maybe doesn't, can't read that information. Um, all caps, that's just a no-no with screen readers, especially it can be really, really difficult for them to use, but it can be useful when you're trying to get out information. 
and then um, bold text, just trying to keep consistent text throughout your map. All right, so now we're going to dive, knowing all those design considerations, then what do we do once we move to the web? So we go back to that map purpose, but then that map purpose of who is being served that map, who is our audience, and that map purpose. And then why are we providing that web map? And then how can we make an interactive visual solution that's accessible at the same time? Interactive maps, as all of you are very well aware, is how can you make something that's just so interactive, so visually stimulating? How can you make that accessible? It just seems like a huge feat that we have to accomplish. And so we go back to that color contrast um, information that we're talking about with the, the map design. And so we actually have certain standards that we can adhere to. And that's going back to, it's called WCAG, so it's the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines um, that's, that's available, it's on the, on the web to use. And one of the considerations for normal text is to have a ratio of, of your colors be 4.5 to 1, and for large text to be 3 to 1. And they have tools out there, I, I'll go into that at the end, um, of some, some options that you can use to be able to test um, those, those contrast ratios to make sure that you're hitting those demands, those needs. Uh, we talked about this earlier, but using color and texture to distinguish elements. And this is a big one as well. This is going to be big for any map, any interactive map, is to make sure that the reading order, the headers, the navigational elements, and the buttons all follow what we would see visually on the page. So as somebody's going through all the elements, they're able to go through it the same way they could visually. And then here's a link out to the WCAG. And then this is, this is another one as well. This is something that I've been working on at my organization is to make sure that we're testing early and often. So not to say, oh, did we do that accessibility check as we're going live with a web map? Because usually that doesn't end well, because at that point we have so many errors that are taking place and we have so little time left in the project to be able to execute it, fix it, and get it out live. So it's making sure that we're going through all these considerations throughout the development cycle. All right, so a couple of different um, organizational aspects as well of web maps is readability. So we have to make sure that we're formatting and we're thinking through what is the information that we wanna convey and how do we do it in a way that it's not overwhelming to our users, but at the same time gives them the information that they need. So that means making the text succinct, but also informational. And then dynamic content changes. So we talked about pop-ups earlier. So making sure that if a pop-up is displayed, that our user, whether it be a screen reader user or visual user, would be able to know there is a pop-up that has loaded on the page. So if they're a screen reader, how do they know that a pop-up has opened and giving that information and then allowing them to get access to that information that has been selected. And then this is a this is also a big one. So if anyone here has heard of ARIA before, ARIA is not always the best solution, but um, we want to refer back to the native HTML. We can certainly use ARIA, but where we can to leverage native HTML. It's just a better, um, a better interface for our users if we're using HTML as it was intended. ARIA is, still works, it still is functional, but where we can to use native HTML. And then this is a big one as well, is to recognize technological constraints. Sometimes the technology just isn't there yet for us to provide a solution. So to be aware of that, and to recognize it and make sure that our audience knows, we know that there's an issue with this as it is because of technological constraints. If you need more information, please contact us at, and then give them a resource for them to be able to contact you directly. So then you can provide that information to them if, if it is needed. An example I like to give is, this is no longer an issue, um, but in the past about six, seven years ago, base map tiles didn't have alt tags. You couldn't make them empty. Um, so you'd have to do a lot of customization in order to make that happen. And so that was a potential constraint for folks that didn't have 
um, coding skills to be able to add that to their web maps. And we had web maps everywhere in the state of Minnesota. So how could we provide that information? So instead, we were able to direct them to uh, an email address that they could contact us at if they needed more information that they could do that. But maybe not the greatest example because how many people that aren't visual care about base map tiles? Probably not that many, but it was probably pretty annoying to hear <laughs> that there were all these images loading and no information um, being depicted back to them. So then testing your web map. So you've created your web map. What do you do next before you go live? So one of the things I really like to recommend is the no mouse challenge. So when you ditch your, your mouse, you take your mouse, you throw it to the side, and you try and get through the, nav the navigation of the application and try and do what you would normally do with a mouse just with your keyboard. And I'll go through a little bit of that in a, in a future slide here. And then setting a visible focus. So when you're navigating through um, using your keyboard, using the tab and the shaft, shift tab keys, that you're able to see where you are visually with this focus. And I think I have an example of that in a later slide as well. And then enabling a skip to option for screen reader users. So a lot of times we might have just data that we're providing in that map. So being able to skip through the map and just have that screen reader be able to go straight to a table so then they can get to the data that they're looking for in that map. All right, so here is the no mouse challenge. So some of the questions that you should ask while you're going through the no mouse challenge are, can you navigate completely without a mouse? Can you navigate as you normally would with a mouse? Do the visual and structural elements match as you expect them to? So as you're going through, are you going through the cancel, the the first header and then the information? Or are you skipping around going from the header to the supply section back up to estimated hours? So is it visually and contextually making sense as you're going through? And are you avoiding any keyboard traps? So if you open up a pop-up, can you get out of the pop-up once you've opened it just using your keyboard? Sometimes some of these uh, solutions don't give us that capability and becomes a keyboard trap. And then making sure that all users can access the same information throughout the application. So nothing is, is just for sighted people, nothing is just for those that are accessing via a keyboard. So I mentioned some of these tricks, but um, to, to access through a keyboard to do the no mouse challenge, there's the tab key. And that's so you can go into the next element and continue forth. If you ever want to go back an element, you can use the shift and tab keys. If you want to select an actual element to proceed, you can use the enter or spacebar keys. And those don't have to be used simultaneously. Those can be used independently. And then also the arrow keys. So this is if you get into a radio button and you want to select a different radio option, you can use the arrow keys to get into that. And those are all the different keys. I just want to pause. Are there any questions about the no mouse functionality? OK. So then um, I think we, we kind of went through this, but some of the questions that you can ask yourself as you're going through those, those different no mouse um, options throughout your application are, can you access all of the maps navigation buttons? So this would be your zoom in, your zoom out buttons. Maybe any widgets that you've created. Can you access the map? Are you able to get into the map, get into if there's a pop-up that's displayed, can, can you get into that physically? This kind of goes into the first question as well, but specifically to the map widgets, because maybe you created one, um, it was a custom solution, and there, there was just a discrepancy with getting into it through the keyboard. And sometimes that is the case when we're creating these custom solutions. Uh, can you access the data? And then can you operate all of the buttons? So you might have additional buttons that you've created in your web map. It could be within the map, or it could be a separate window that's created. But can those buttons be accessed with just your keyboard? 
And then if there's any sliders or other controls, can folks use the arrow keys to be able to change those sliders or, or information, or potentially even add in their own custom um, number for that to change. And then this will go into the focus that we'll get into next, but can you easily tell where you are on the page? So these are the seven questions that we usually ask ourselves when we're doing some testing within our team. All right, so this is an example of a focus. This is an um, application that I made. Um, it's probably been a decade, so it's pretty old. But as, I'm, as you're navigating through the page, are you able to physically see um, a focus? And you can see there's some contrast. It's not fabulous with this, but overall it does the job of providing where we are contextually on the page as we're navigating through using our keyboard. I'm just gonna let this run for a little while. And then you can see that skip to table. We'll talk about that in an additional slide as well, but I just wanted to point that out that that skip to table was hidden until we navigate into it and then it's shown visually to the user. So it's really nice because it hides it from our visual users unless they start to, to tab into it, but it also provides that context that's um, visual once we get into it, if a visual user is interested in it. All right, so that focus that we just saw, it matches the order of the elements that we saw. So as we're navigating through, we're able to see it go throughout the map. It's not skipping around, it's going through a direct order as we're depicting it. And we wanna make sure it's distinguishable. and that it's usable to a lar larger audience. It's a very nice handy tool to allow not only um, those that maybe don't have the same contrast ratios as us, but, but it helps everybody, all of our user base. And then this can also be helpful as mentioned previously to a skip to option for folks. So now when we're talking about the actual skip to option, um, when it's feasible, this gives us a, a, the opportunity to give that shortcut to our users. They maybe just want to get into that information. They don't necessarily care about the entire functionality of the application. Maybe they're just in, interested in one thing in particular, and that goes back to that map purpose. What information are we providing? So it gives a shortcut for those folks. So the, the example that I have here is that skip to um, table that we saw. Um, there's also a couple... Uh, different um, examples, I think the one that I have here, I'm gonna open this, is WebAIM. I don't know if anyone is familiar with this website. Just gonna, sorry, I lost the video. Did, did anybody nod their head that they're familiar with this website? A few people, not everybody, okay. So um, so this is a, this is a great, um, great resource. I'll talk about this one in the tools section. But as I'm tabbing through right away, the very first tab that I make on the page, you can see the skip to main content shows up. It's It's got a red background and white um, hyperlink underneath. And if I click it right away, it zooms to that area of interest. So I get to skip over all of the headers, all of the navigation system of that page. So it gives that context. It goes through information that's maybe not pertinent to me. I already been to this website. I already am familiar with it. I just want to get to the good stuff, the meat um, of, of this web page. So it allows you to do that. And so here's a skip to table example. Um, these are two separate examples just to show some some options that are available. So this first one here on the left is um, showing a quasi interactive map um, where users can hover over, get information about their county, but maybe that's not everything that they wanna do and there's, there's a table that's available too that they're able to get that information in the same way. Uh, but we wanted that option for people, um, and this is for, for the cited, non-cited, but also for maybe somebody who's just interested in data. So it gives, again, to a larger audience, it gives more perspective. And then th this is the one um, from the previous example that I was showing, that if you click that skip to table, this is what opens up for, for those users. So they're able to see all of the information that's depicted in the interactive map, but in a tab tabular format. 
All right, any questions so far before I dive into tools? This is the last section I have. Okay. So these are the topics um, that I wanted to present to, to you all today. Um, humans are by far, the, the reason that humans are so high up in the this list is because tools can only give us so much information. Humans are really the best option for testing. So if you can, always try and include a human into, into the, the formula. It's not always feasible with what we're creating, but I really recommend reaching out to a human because it's just you're going to get the best information from from a human that has that experience and is going to be very honest with you you're you're going to know right away what their issue is um working with them and they're going to be for the most part hopefully helpful in in getting to you to an end goal um so the, this is used for for all of your design aspects of the map so whether it be creating a really nice map you're working in a pdf or a png image or in the web. So that's what the use column is for. Um, Color Oracle, another really great tool. So um, I showed this one earlier when we showed the Lime example. So when I threw that into a tool, I used Color Oracle to be able to depict what the limes could look like potentially to somebody who had a color deficiency. Um, assistive technology. Um, so this is like your screen readers. Um, so that's used for static web. And um, We'll get into web color, web aim, the color contrast checker. Showed that one also earlier with the contrast. Um, Wave, Axe, and then browser tools are all for web-based solutions. So we'll dive into each of these. Um, so humans, um, they're they're not the the tools aren't the catch-all. It's humans that really give us that information. So the best software that we know of that's available probably only catches about 25% of what we know to be known accessibility issues. So keeping that in mind, even if you pass every single test that's out there, there's so many things we're not catching. So that's why it's so, so important to include humans into this conversation. And end user testing, can, it can be really, it can be expensive, um, but it can get us to the end goal. Um, I think, yes, okay, that's probably enough on humans. I, I can't reiterate enough how important humans are. Um, so Color Oracle. So this one is a download um, option. It's available on Windows, Mac, and Linux. It's free. Um, and it applies a filter to your entire screen. So for me with dual monitors, it'll apply it to both of my screens. Um, I believe you need Java in order to have it downloaded. And anytime my Java gets updated, so this is the forewarning, if you don't have this and you download it, anytime my Java gets re-downloaded, re I have to do an update. Um, it causes issues, so you might have to um, do a reinstall with Color Oracle. But it's this is the one thing that I always have on my machine. Um, I just mentioned this. This has um, been approved through our state of Minnesota network, which it's super hard for us to get anything approved. So that just shows how important it is to the state of Minnesota. Um, it's available at uh, this website, colororacle.org. Um, and so how this works is when you download it, it's a .exe file. Um, so I recommend wherever it gets downloaded on your machine, make sure you know where it is because it's just sitting there as an exe. And um, once you click on the exe, it creates an icon in your system tray. And um, then you just right click it to activate it and select the appropriate filter. And so this is an example of what it looks like. So this is a normal, um, a normal map that we've created for the Minnesota DNR, and then with it um, being activated with the Deuteranopia filter, this is what that same app looks like. So let's show it before and after again. And the reason I like to show this one is because this is probably one or more complex state park maps. It has, this is our biggest state park in Minnesota by far and it has almost everything imaginable on it. So it's, it's a really good rule of thumb to, to use with the filters. Uh, so assistive technology. So this is for static and web. 
Um, some of the options that are available out there are JAWS, which is um, very, very expensive. Um, it is, I, I think I have a slide after this that that shows um, the use of it, but it is the most used screen reader out there um, in the world. Uh, there's NVDA, which is free, um, but there are some limitations with NVDA and NVDA and JAWS are vastly different products. Um, they have different, different uses. Um, so just to keep that in mind that if you test one, that doesn't mean it works with the other. There's also VoiceOver, um, that's an Apple product. Uh, Microsoft Narrator and Chromebox. And so this is that graphic that I was mentioning that over time to see the use of those screen readers. Um, so JAWS, um, it kind of, I'm not sure what happened here in August 2019, but it went down and NVDA was actually in the lead. And then all of a sudden, um, I was just, I was surprised by this graphic. I just looked this up about six months ago. And yeah, nice try, NVIDIA. Um, and so JAWS came back, and it's now number one again. So I'm not sure if maybe a lot of people weren't doing the survey here, because this is a um, WebAIM survey, or what happened. But um, JAWS is still number one. And VoiceOver kind of consistently at the bottom here. So still being used, but these two are the top. And so just an example of voiceover, which this is a really cool exercise that one of my colleagues put together um, doing a test on one of our um, mobile applications is um, it creates these, um, these different uh, grids and then you can um, speak to that grid. So in this example, you could say, I wanna go to grid 13 and it, it'll highlight an additional grid um, within that first grid and then you can select grid one within 13, and then it can give you that information that's that's being depicted in the map. It's a really, really cool um, example of it being used. Um, then there's the web aim color contrast checker. So this is the one that we showed earlier. And you can input in your foreground color, your background color, and it'll give you an actual contrast ratio. And what's even cooler is if you are a developer and you use um, the like developer tool set, this is now an option to be able to see live in code. So they've, um, a lot of these browsers have adopted the color contrast checker from WebAIM just straight into their developer toolkit. So it's really nice. You don't have, have to always go out to WebAIM, but it is a nice resource if you're just getting started in a project and you want to just make sure that you have a good contrast ratio. Um, Wave, this is one of my favorite tools. Uh, this is a browser extension. It is available in Firefox and Chrome, and I believe maybe um, Edge now as well. Um, I, don't quote me on that, but that I believe is um, now supported. And this will go through, and you can you can go through all the different items that potentially are not meeting accessibility standards on your page, and it'll give you a nice summary and details as far as what the errors if there's any contrast errors, um, alerts that maybe you should take care of before doing a deployment. And then it'll also give you a list of the features, structural elements, and then ARIA that's on the page as well. Um, and one thing I like to just mention too with maps is because they're so visual and there's a lot of CSS on the page is to turn off this styles option because then you can go through your elements more readily. Um, than if you were just to have styles on. It doesn't show you as much information. So I really recommend turning off styles when you're dealing with a lot of visual products. Um, Axe, this one is the most used tool that's out there. Um, it gives you really similar information that Wave does. Um, instead of doing teaching with it, that's kind of Wave's big thing is teaching you how to fix it. Um, Axe just gives you what that error is. Uh, so you usually have to do more research if you're not always familiar with it. But um, that's also part of the free toolkit. I've, I'm not familiar with the paid product. There is a paid portion for Axe. Um, but I believe Google and Apple use Axe exclusively for all their accessibility testing. And it is a Chrome extension, but I believe it's also available in Firefox. Don't quote me on that though, either. <laughs> and then um, browser developer tools. This is always changing. Browsers are getting better. They're supporting these as options. Um, this one is, is one that Google Chrome adopted 
about a year and a half ago um, called Lighthouse. And um, in their report, they now have an accessibility option. So it'll give you a report to say what your score is between zero and 100, and it'll tell you how you can improve on it. And that's all I have. Um, I have a link out to the state of Minnesota documents that we've put together. Um, we have a lot of documentation out there. It's probably daunting. So that's the next step of what we're working towards is creating these videos. Um, so they're like four to five, six minute videos. And so um, I put together four so far, um, just on the interactive part and focused on the tools that we went through at the end. Um, but we're hoping to make that more broad and make it more available. It's right now it's just unlisted, but um, but it's available as a resource. So any questions? Uh, kidding, that was great. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I have a question just right off the bat. I want to find out more about that grid with the um, screen reader. What was that exactly? Yeah, that was voiceover. I might have missed that one. Yeah, what is right that? Here. Yeah, this, yeah. Yeah, so this is um this is just part of Apple. Um if you use voice or on any Apple device, this is um what I guess is depicted. I haven't tried it out myself, but one of my colleagues is very rehearsed in it and likes to test all of our mobile applications that we release. So it creates these grids. It's pretty pretty cool. As long as you have accessibility in mind with that solution. Right. Oh, neat. <laughs> Design guy wants more grids. I do. Uh, yeah, any other questions? I know we're coming up close to the hour here. I was curious about where you were mentioned. I think it's kind of one of your early slides about cognitive considerations and, you know, having like a more simple, easy to read interfaces which made me think like that just seems like a good design principle generally i'm kind of wondering like is there an example of a design that meets some sort of cognitive limitation requirement that would actually be not useful for the general public like i, I would sort of think like the further you can push in that direction the better um yeah that's a that's a great question um i i guess comment too um but but yeah, I have I have a colleague that that has had many TBIs, uh, traumatic brain injury um, incidents, and so I like to do a lot of testing with with her um, because I I I really like to make sure that I'm hitting um, that um, that audience. I guess it's it, she that's no more neurological, I guess too, but um but yeah just making it very clear and to the mission of what you're trying to provide is is so so important but um but yeah i really i really like to test that a lot in my maps i think that's just good practice i think you're spot on um Great. Any other questions at all? I think we can uh, wrap this up and let's have uh, three minutes to spare. That was awesome. That was yeah. Really, really cool. um, yeah, Kitty, I'm sure you're going to share all the links and everything, and I can post them in our own internal Slack for everybody to get familiar with the web content accessibility guidelines, a little bedtime reading for sure. Sorry, uh, one thing. can you go back? Can you go to your end slide with the link there? Uh, Sorry, yeah. All good. Yeah. You're just writing it down. Okay, perfect. All right. So thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, and I'll share I'll share all the uh, re resources uh, in Slack afterwards. Thanks, That's everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks so much, Kitty. That was amazing. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.